So today, uh, for our workshop, we have one of our expert engineers from Midas Expert Network, which is Tom Les from Wolpert. So Tom Les is the senior associate team leader and also bridge and structural, structural engineer from Wolpert. So Tom is already here with us right now. Uh, and hi, Tom, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Welcome, okay. everyone. Uh, Tom, again, thank you so much for joining our session today. We are so excited to, you know, learn from your experience and hopefully this uh, presentations and workshop can be helpful for our audience. So yeah, Tom, before we move on to the sessions, uh, maybe you can give us uh, introductions about yourself and whenever you're ready, you can start the sessions. Thank you. I'm sure. going to make um, you the presenter right now. I was going to say, yeah, I can share my screen whenever you're ready. Okay. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, Tom, I can see your screen. Okay, great. Uh, so thank you everyone for joining. Oops, this is the other screen there. Um, and I'm gonna go through uh, this presentation. I'm gonna leave a good amount of time at the end for questions um, and discussion. I, you know, I see a workshop as being something of a place where you can uh, get more questions answered, feedback provided. So I want to make sure that we're going to leave time for that. Um, I do have a hard to stop at four, so just to let everyone know, if, if I can't get to questions though at the end, I will be happy to take that offline and follow up with anyone who needs it. Um, quick outline of what we'll talk about here. I'll do a little quick introduction, talk about the structure types recommended for advanced analysis using Midas. Um, you can use it for any bridge, but you know specific ones do require uh, something like Midas to, to perform analysis on it. Um, Midas modeling discussion, some composite steel examples, some tips and resources around composite steel, and then a little bit of a more of a live demo or in program, um, just showing you where to go to to find certain things um, and how to look at them, and hopefully look at them easier. So uh, I'm bridge and team Hi, leader. Um, um, I'm so sorry yes. to interrupt. Um, yeah. Do you mind? Uh, kind of uh, going into the presentation mode, and when you do. You can change the screen where the you can actually go to the display setting okay and try to change up the screen where you know like the power the original oh, powerpoint yeah. will be projected to exactly yes thank you all right got it sorry everyone um so i've got a number of um items here uh not going to really read through them all but um experience with mostly uh, complex geometry uh, modeling and composite hybrid uh, curved structure that type of thing i also personally i do work with engineers without borders uh, it's a great organization so i'm going to use this opportunity for a shameless plug um, to support your local chapter of engineers without borders uh, Wolpert was founded in 1911 in Dayton, Ohio. We've got 30 offices um, worldwide, 900 employees and counting, um, and uh, do work all over the United States um, with that. So my quick uh, firm-wide or firm description there. So structure types recommended for advanced analysis. Um, basically referring to ASHTO here for the most part, Specific states may have additional requirements or preferences on what gets kicked into finite element or advanced design. Um, curve structures, you, know, you can refer to 4612. Um, note that in a curve structure, cross frames are primary members. They are no longer secondary members. Um, so that's that's something when you're doing that design that uh, changes a little bit. Um, also, the curvature may be ignored if certain conditions are met. Concentric beam lines, um, the bearings are pretty much radial stiffness of everything is fairly similar and the arc length is less than 0.06 radians. Again, you know, low curvature, large radius, um, everything is fairly consistent. Um, in those cases, you could go to something like a V-load analysis as opposed to going into like a full-blown um, 2D grillage um, or 3D model. Highly skewed structures also require the advanced analysis. Um, unusual framing, multiple substructure skews, multi-skew structures, uh, flared framing plans, dog legged, and then um, if you even had like a straight beam line, but they framed into like a header pier where the um, the beam and the pier cap are actually rigidly connected and you start to get those, um, you know, the stiffness of the substructure incorporated into the superstructure distribution of, of moments and shears, you know, that may be a case where you end up kicking into something more like this. 
Um, this guideline for steel girder bridge analysis that was put out by Ashto and NSVA is a very good document. If you have not looked at it, I highly recommend it. Um, it is free online. Just search up that, uh, that name, G13.1, Ashto NSVA. Um, and they have in there a nice, uh, you know, analysis of the different types of analysis. So here you can see um, the scoring, and this is basically compared to a 3D full plate model, how well a traditional 2D grid, a 1D line girder, and an improved 2D grid did compared to that full 3D. And you'll see that the improved 2D grid, which is basically what Midas does as a default, um, fares fairly well um, compared to the 3D full analysis. Um, there are a couple items that you can't really do quite as well. Um, you know, flange lateral uh, bending stresses get a little bit different, in particular the um, web layover or how much uh, out of plane um, distortion that you're getting on, on girders or beam lines uh, is a bit different in an all plate model versus a improved 2D grid. And that's because of the individual web stiffness out of plane as a fairly uh, narrow element, um, you, you know, that does do a little bit better in an all plate than you would with a improved 2D grid. But for the majority of what we're looking at um, when we're trying to analyze these, you know, very, very similar results, which is a good thing. The 1D line girder is what you might traditionally think of just simplified line girder analysis using Merlin Dash or similar other program. Um, and I'll get into kind of the differences between these model types. So, you know, traditional girder line with V-load, that's, you know, that you could look at that for uh, curved bridges, but with, again, that very low curvature, very much a simplified girder line system. The two-dimensional grillage analysis, um, traditional, and then the grillage 2D plus, um, or, um, you know, advanced 2D is sometimes what you'll hear called. I'll go through kind of what, what that is and the definition there, and then the three-dimensional analysis. So traditional girder line modeling, we're just using standard Astro live load distribution factors out of the uh, tables. Um, minimal time, not complicated. V load can help you with um, basically applying your uh, additional forces that you might receive from curvature to that um, very traditional approach. And that generally works pretty well up to, you know, about 1,000 to 1,200 foot radius. Um, you start getting below there and um, things get a little bit out of whack as far as the internal um, you know, checks it's doing, which is basically just an equilibrium check within the um, section. So you're, you're kind of making sure that your cross frames and your, your beam lines are in equilibrium and there's some horizontal and vertical forces that get um, distributed that way that also have effects on moment. So, um, you know, there's a lot of references out there for how to do this. It's not terribly difficult. Um, and then there's some restrictions as to when you can use this and it does have, tend to underestimate things like deflections, uh, twists, that sort of thing that's a little bit more um, into the finite element realm. Um, and again, you get radius above a thousand feet, fairly radial piers, um, and it may work just fine for you, but you start to get below that and uh, you do need to kick it into something a little bit more complicated. So grillage analysis or simplified 2D um, basically treats the beam elements as a beam um, and the plate elements attached to it um, as you know, an eccentric beam, or they may even be just a virtual where they, uh, everything is just a planar 2D. Um, and the big thing here is you are not incorporating the stiffness of the cross frames or your other um, boundary members that uh, maybe it's diaphragms or whatever you have at the end of the bridge. Um, so that gives a little more accurate distribution of the live loads because you're going through an influence surface and not an influence line. Um, and we're not using the uh, empirical equations out of Ashto. We're actually developing a surface, seeing where that load goes based on the plates. Um, however, you know, again, the internal forces due to curvature or high skew are not really fully captured in this, this approach because you aren't really getting the um, three-dimensional stiffness of of the cross frames or other elements that are in between your beams. So a 2D plus um, grillage analysis or limited 3D analysis, there's a couple terms for this. Um, this is essentially your, your standard MIDAS um, you know, beam as frame and uh, the deck as plate. And it's similar to the, the standard grillage, but the big difference here is, is that we're using rigid links and we're getting the full cross frame stiffness in three dimensions. 
Um, so this gives us a more accurate distribution of live loads through the influence surface because we have captured the stiffness of those secondary members or primary members in a curved situation. Um, and any end boundary, things like the uh, you know, diaphragms, that sort of thing. Um, so the internal forces are, are captured um, and it's appropriate for curved girder design, um, composite design using uh, multi-skew, that type of, uh, of structure. Um, and then again, it's deck is plate beam is frame in the wizard for um, composite modeling within Midas. The all frame uh, modeling uh, also uses this method, but the deck is modeled as virtual transverse beams. Uh, I generally haven't used the all frame a whole lot. I mostly use the deck as plate beam as frame one. Um, and then we also do include seventh degree of freedom for warping effects within the system. Um, so what does that look like? Um, here's you know stick model um, from the uh, output or well, really just the, the minus file in general. Um, one of the things that I, I'll note here and I have this towards the back to you in general tips is if you renumber your nodes and elements by beam, um, so that all of your, your beam line one are 10,000 to whatever, 20,000 to whatever for girder two. That really does help um, pulling things out in Midas, looking at things, just you know everything that you try to do within it, it makes it a little bit easier. So I do recommend that as a tip. Um, Three-dimensional here, this is gonna be again, similar to Grilge Plus. The, the big difference now is that we split the beam into separate plate elements for the flange and web, in addition to the plates for the deck. So everything is a plate um, in the three-dimensional modeling. Uh, this provides very accurate distribution of live loads through the influence surface. Um, you're really fully capturing the lateral stiffness of everything, including the out-of-plane lateral stiffness of your um, flange and web separately. Um, and then you're fully capturing all the internal forces um, within your model. Uh, you can look at tension field action, you can look at oil canning or um, distortion, web distortion from out of plane loads. So when you have a screed machine out there with a bracket arm um, for the overhang construction, you've got a, usually a member coming back into the web that's applying a force out of, out of plane against the, the narrow part of the web and that can cause a distortion, particularly at deep uh, sections. So you get above 78 to 84 inches and you're out outside of the normal range that the, um, the brackets use. So now your bracket is hitting somewhere mid, mid height of your web and that can cause some out of, out of plane distortion. So we wanna look at that. That's another thing that we can capture within the old plate. So here's just a couple little diagrams there for tension field action, um, for what that looks like. Um, it's basically just, you know, there's a nonlinear um, kind of asymptotic um, in the um, stress uh, distribution or uh, from your bearing point up to kind of the more uh, top of girder. It's almost like deep, deeping action within, within concrete. It's just within steel. Um, and we can model that using, you know, simplified strut and tie sort of setups or, you know, more explicitly using an all plate, you can see the distribution of stresses through the, uh, through the system. This is what that looks like in a simplified three-dimensional model. You can see you have separate plates for the uh, top flange, bottom flange, web, and then the beam itself. So where do you find this in Midas? Um, if you're doing the composite girder wizard, it'll be right here on the right-hand side in the modeling type, um, and those have, a you know, distinct differences, all frame, all plate. Again, the one I use most often, deck is plate, girder is frame, and then everything is as frame. Um, there is also some modeling, uh, both distinctions here between what it can do in the outputs and also, um, you know, how you, you go about the input and how you do your runs. So the all plate is not gonna give you your code equation checks. Uh, a lot of those equation checks are based on forces and the all plate is going to put everything into stress and not force. So it becomes difficult to correlate that back to the AASHTO requirements for individual checks that need to be done. So that is a limitation of the all plate. Um, even though you're doing a much more advanced analysis, you're getting more data, more information, it is stress-based and that is more difficult to pull back into those equations. So it's not gonna do your automated checks that you usually like to see. Uh, but it's going to give you more things like the out-of-plane distortion of the of the girder, the rotation, um, that sort of thing, much better. Um, it also has much longer runtime, so all plates going to take longer to run than the uh, incorporating frame elements within your your system. 
So some examples here that I've got, these are ones that I did do in uh, Midas Civil or, or worked with my team to do. Um, so this one is a very highly curved structure um, using a 200 foot radius at the center line. We've got the minimum girder radius is 181 feet, uh, 28 degree, you know, sub 10 to dark there, um, or I'm sorry, the degree of curvature and about, um, you know, 90 degrees sub 10 to dark. Everything is radial though, so that is nice. That does help. And it's eight spans and they're, they're relatively short spans. A lot of that is due to um, how much you can really fabricate. That out of a piece of steel plate, you can only cut so long of a piece um, out of a single plate in order to make a piece of girder when you're talking this, this amount of curvature. So we did a construction stage analysis um, using you know, the wizard. Um, you know, basically you just put in how many core sequences you want. You do need to do some manual adjustment of that after, after the wizard comes out, uh, but it's really just assigning when those are composite and when those are non-composite to each construction stage. One of the things to note here um, when we had this project was that there's a um, lateral stress equation here from ASHTO 61016. Uh, which is really talking about the combined vertical and flange lateral bending uh, stresses. And they have a limit in there, uh, 0.6 FYF, um, or the yield stress of your flange. Now, this is one that's a little bit weird because they essentially say that, um, you know, stresses somewhat larger than that are okay. Well, what does somewhat larger mean in a code context? So at a certain point, it becomes an engineering judgment. In this case, um, we actually allowed the flange lateral stresses to be a little bit higher than that, about 10 to 20%, as long as our utility ratio, which is the combination of the lateral and the longitudinal stress, were below unity. Um, and that was more of just an engineering judgment just, you know, decision. A lot of the areas where we were getting higher flange lateral bending had fairly low longitudinal stresses. So the overall stress was okay. Um, but again, just something to, to watch out for if you get into high curvature or, or a lot of lateral stress. Uh, the modeling of your boundary conditions is really important here. So here you can see our um, boundary conditions. And what we did was we took girder line three as our limiting line, and that one received full lateral restraint along it. Um, and then we let everything else basically float. So we had, you know, longitudinal, uh, restraint at the middle pier. We had lateral restraint along girder line three and all other bearings float on elastomeric. And we did an analysis of those um, girder retainers. So that was, that was a little bit interesting, um, mostly just limiting stress within the stiffeners. That's what the final product looks like. Uh, this is at the Cincinnati airport um, and very high curvature, came out very nice. Another one here that did this uh, curved four span bridge, um, much lower curvature, about 1200 foot radius, uh, but we did have multi skew on top of the curvature. Um, there you can see the bridge. And another interesting thing, this had Amish buggies as well as uh, 55 mile an hour semi trucks. So definitely a mix of traffic on this one. Here we had a part width construction. And we were able to put that into Midas using the wizard and then add on to it with some temporary supports. So you can see the towers um, in this model. Here's another view of the temporary support towers. Another one that we had uh, is TUS 77. This bridge is flared. So you can see that there are a couple girder lines on the bottom um, that flare inwards and the other lines are relatively straight. Now, one of the things you can't set up the wizard to give you the flare to begin with, but what we found that worked pretty well was you could basically run it out as if everything was square and then tweak in the node locations along those exterior two girder lines to get the flare. And that allowed us to quickly generate the model, have all the linkages correct, and then basically just adjust inwards those, those lines that needed it to account for the flare. Um, which was definitely time saving versus trying to add those in manually. So some tips and resources. Um, one I already kind of went over of, you know, renumbering your, your beam and girder nodes um, and beam lines. So here you can see, you know, the outer 
uh, first girder line is is the 10,000 series and 20,000 series. We had four girder lines here, and then we went to 50,000 for our cross frames. Um, this allows you to very quickly uh, isolate any of those members that you want to um, and quickly change properties on those as well. So um, I highly recommend doing this. It definitely is a time saver throughout the process. One of the other tips I'll give here in, in composite analysis is to make sure in your construction stage sequence, um, if you're applying construction stage um, differentials, is to make sure that if you update your composite properties or your steel beam properties, you need to go back and update the long-term and age here. These are your composite section properties. If you do not hit update on these, it will not propagate the new composite section information through. So don't forget to do that if you um, are you know, changing out girder sections in your model. Also, um, you know, another thing to remember is that screed loads um, during construction, um, you know, are a thing that you want to look at. And I didn't show them here, but bracket loads as well. And those do need to apply, be applied manually. Um, you know, one of the things maybe one day uh, Midas will um, develop it is the um, adding in like a moving screed load into construction stage analysis. But as of now, at least as far as I'm aware, that's not a, uh, a feature. So we do that manually. You can see I did that for this first stage where we're going to, we've got the beam line set, we've got our diaphragms in, then we're going to pour out to here. So this is the worst case location for those screed loads. Then it's now solidified. We do another pour, get it closer in. And then this was the final pour. Um, we'll have wet deck. We have the exterior bracket loads, and then we have screed loads applied at the middle right here um, before it goes to final composite. Boundary conditions are also very important. Um, you're gonna to wanna to make sure to model them appropriately. There's a lot of resources that Midas provides. Um, this is out of one of the tutorials. Um, and you can see that they give you the simplified equations. You can come up with them yourself just by the standard elastomeric um, bearing equations. But if you'd like to have the, the quick version, you can see there's the KH, KV, K theta, or rotational, vertical, and horizontal stiffness of the bearing given by um, the parameters of your bearing. So um, this is what will go into your model. Um, and there's a number of resources like this that, that make things fairly easy. Um, and I definitely recommend looking into those. A lot of what I'm talking about here does assume a bit of knowledge about the composite wizard. Um, so I, I'm not gonna delve unless people would like, like me to delve into it, but I'm not gonna go through all the, the stages of setting up the composite wizard. There is a lot of resources online for that. So there's tons of minus tutorials um, at the link I've got there on the top. There's the same that um, Tito had provided. Um, the steel composite wizard tutorial is right there. And then there's an online user manual that has a lot of information in it as well. So definitely use those as resources. Um, and then I'm gonna go into a model now to talk about um, just a few places to look within your model or places that are easily missed. Um, and then open it up for questions as well to make sure that we've got time to help answer if anyone's got any issues or things that they would like me to cover in more detail. And like I said, I can go back into the composite wizard if, um, if that's of interest. So before I go to questions, I'm gonna go to this model. So this is a single span. Um, it's got a uh, skew to it. However, it is not curved. In this case, we did go to the uh, finite element because this is a 225 foot single span, so quite a quite a long span. Um, and this is to basically go over a river with a very, very high uh, flow rate that basically was gonna wipe out, you know, piers or cause major scour issues if we were putting substructures in the water. So we are jumping over it entirely. Um, and, you know, these are plate girders, um, steel system. This is a composite setup. This was done using the composite wizard, um, relatively straightforward. Now, a couple of things I'll note here. So as I mentioned, we numbered these, these lines. Um, so if I go to 10,000 to let's say 10,500 or some bigger number, you can see that that selects out just my girder line one. So this is kind of what I'm talking about of why you wanna do that. You can then activate and easily isolate just that girder line. If you active all, you can bring back everything else. If you wanna see the girder line two, you can do the same thing. Um, this 
really does help with some of the visualizations because then you could go into your results and go to your forces and look at your forces and moments um, on this girder. So this allows you to see each one separately and then you could always go back to the main menu and um, get everything back or just activate all. And now you can see all of them. Uh, one thing I'm doing here, you know, the zoom in and out in the pan are using your middle mouse button. If you hold control and then you do your middle button, it rotates. That's a nice little um, tip there too, if you don't aware of it. Um, now in the composite modeling, so getting a little bit more into you know, why you were here today, the composite design is right here under the design section. So after you've run your analysis and you want to get deeper into the composite setup, uh, that's right here. So we've got des general design parameters. These come basically straight out of AASHTO. Uh, P factors for reduction factors. Um, we're not using a box type, so this doesn't really matter too much, but if you were using a steel box or a concrete box, you might consider those. Um, here we've got a couple other optional items for negative flexure or looking at um, the positive flexure and compact section, and then which ones do we want to check for strength, service, constructability, fatigue, that sort of thing. Um, oops, I was going to cancel. I don't want to change anything. Design materials. Here's where you put in your composite section. So in this case, I actually have a hybrid girder. So what I mean by that is that our top and bottom flanges are grade 70 steel, and our middle uh, web element is going to be grade 50 right here. We have um, concrete section, 4,500 uh, you know, pounds per square foot, uh, or square inch, I should say, uh, concrete. And then we've got grade 60 mild rebar. So all of that defines the materials for the composite section. We also have just uh, grade 50 steel for the uh, cross frames. This grade 70 kind of hangs out in here because that was part of what um, does the non-composite for these construction stage loading. Um, during the assembly and erection. Load combination types, these are pretty easy. You trigger over your strength combinations, your service combinations. I can add in the fatigue limit state one and two here. Um, I don't have those run right now, but we can put those in easy enough. These start to get into relatively um, standard items here, longitudinal reinforcement. Here we've got the um, exterior beam left, composite one, um, composite one, composite two, if there's any change in your rebar. The one thing, this was fairly simple and you can see there's a fairly low number of sections. If you have things with piers, oftentimes you're gonna have more reinforcing above your pier in the deck. Um, and so you'll have to break those up a little bit more in order to apply the extra reinforcing steel there. And this, you essentially just go to, um, you know, the location, here you can see I've got eight number fours on the top line, 10 number fives at the bottom. We look at transverse stiffeners. These are fairly easy. You've got transverse stiffener for the web and for a bearing stiffener. You can pop that open, put in your stiffener properties. Is it one or two stiffeners? And then hit apply. Unbraced length is an item of note to watch out for. Um, you do need to apply unbraced length along your length. You can see what, what's being applied here if you hit this dot, dot, dot and pop this open. And you can see you've got 90.3 inches as my unbraced length, which is my cross frame spacing. Um, one note here though, is if you do not apply anything on the unbraced length manually to the uh, beam elements, it's going to assume that the length of the beam element is the unbraced length. And oftentimes that's going to be lower than your actual cross frame spacing. So it's very important to apply the actual unbraced length given by your uh, lateral restraint, cross frames or diaphragms, whatever you're using um, on those beam lines. And that's something that, that's relatively easy to miss, um, but does impact a lot of the equations around uh, lateral torsional buckling. Design position. So this is going to be where do you want to run the design. So again, you can pop that out. You can input it here. You can select and hit apply. Uh, so I just ran all over line one. Note, I just did the I locations because the J location of 
10,089 is the same as the I location of 10,090. So while I can run INJ here, it's not really giving me any additional information other than I might wanna run INJ at the very end, the last element. Um, otherwise though, it's really not adding anything and it's doubling your runtime for exporting that design. All right, so uh, shear connector, here's where you input that information, pitch, height, diameter, uh, ultimate stress, transfer spacing, number of stiffeners, all of that good stuff. Um, and again, the dot, dot, dot pop out, very useful to check what's in here. Link between moments, something that you have to look at. Um, this is again, that positive moment to end or positive moment to positive moment. Uh, here I've got a C prime fatigue category for my shear studs. Uh, so that's pretty common as far as a fatigue designation. Hopefully we're not doing much with uh, E or E primes these days on new bridges, but sometimes you'll run into that as well. Going down through the list here, we have fatigue parameters. So that's where I applied, you know, the number of cycles. Again, if you have any questions about it, you know, did I apply it correctly? You can pop out the, um, the full listing and here you can see what is being applied to everything. Moving on, uh, curve bridge info. So if you have a curve structure, you can apply some radius uh, information, convex concave, to help with some of the equations it's running. And deck overhang loads, you could apply uh, some additional overhang loads if you would like to. Now, I, I typically don't use this one as much. You certainly can. Um, I mostly actually model them explicitly here in my static loads. So parapet loads, other loads that would uh, be eccentric um, you know, on the overhang, I will actually just explicitly model them with, uh, with this system. So you can see there's my barrier loads applied along the outside edge. Um, so up to you how you wanna do it. But um, again, I, I like the explicit just cause it's a little bit easier for me to check and visualize um, what's going on. So now we get into the design tables. This is basically reporting out um, the information that you put in. So if I went to the shear connectors, it's essentially the same table there. Um, and then you can run the design using this design and do an Excel report on any things that you want. I'll get into that in a second. Uh, but before I do, we'll go to the design result tables and look at what those uh, look like. So here is the total checking. You can see I've got flexor strength here, service limits, fatigue limits, construction, cases, here, and flexure. Uh, one of the nice things within Midas, you can easily export this to Excel if you would like. You also have some of the Excel functions directly in program. So if I right click, I can go to my sorting dialog and easily add in any additional sorting that I would like. So for instance, right now I added um, sorting by MU over VMN. So having it sorted by that makes it very nice so that I can kind of look at my worst case moment controlled member, which is at this element 10,039. So I can quickly see that is the worst case moment. You can do the same thing if you'd like to sort here by maximum shear. You can move that up in the sorting. So now it's gonna sort by maximum shear, then maximum moment, then the element number, part number, and positive or negative. Um, and so that, that allows you to do some very easy sorting in here um, that makes life uh, a little bit simpler to look at results. And again, exportable to Excel um, easily. You can see there's individual checks. So if we went into the, the Fletcher check, um, you'll see the all of the actual equations, the MY, MP, EMN, um, all of the values that make up that check. And this really reads directly into that total checking. It just is giving you a little bit more information about how it got there. Same thing with the service limit state. You can see the um, stresses that it's checking and the limitation stress. Shear connectors, same deal. It'll check bearing stiffeners, longitudinal um, stiffener as well if you have them applied. 
So we can go into the shear stiffener, or sorry, there we go. And you can see that actually for the most of this, not actually even needed, which isn't surprising. Right, we've got a fairly beefy web, um, so we're fine there. Now going into the output, um, what it looks like. I'll go ahead and open that up. The screen here. So this is the output if you do the Excel. And what it's going to show you is your general section properties, your girder properties, how it's getting the elastic section, flexural resistance, and it goes through each of the, the steps within here. Web proportion checks, all of these will cite Ashto directly so that you can see that the checks are being performed and they're they're the ones that you want to do or if there's any exceptions that you could look at it and say actually you know that's okay because of some other reason um, you know engineering judgment or otherwise so um, we're satisfying these provisions it's going to show you explicitly what it's doing which is very nice um, here you can see it's compact section it's going to calculate out all of your actual composite section information. Again, you can see the equations explicitly and the results. So that's very useful. Uh, we always save off, you know, the controlling element information that comes out of this as part of our project record. Um, that it's not just a black box that says okay, but that we actually look at this and, um, you know, make sure that everything is coming out the way that we planned and it's checking everything that we wanted to check. So there's negative which actually doesn't matter. So th this is an instance, this is no good, but I don't have negative. I'm in a positive moment only condition. So I don't actually care that it doesn't meet this provision because I don't have any negative moment. So that's an example of where you could look at it, evaluate it from the engineering standpoint. It's gonna go through shear, fatigue. If, I didn't bother running the fatigue here, but if you have shear connectors and longitudinal stiffeners checked, which I didn't run the fatigue, so it's not gonna give me a shear connector output. So with that, I'll go back to the main model here. Um, that's basically most of the composite design menu. Um, you can look at individual stages through the system, stage 2-1, 2-2. One thing to note here is your loads also update so looking at a construction stage analysis, you can see there's a wet concrete case. If I display that, it's going to be on the beam lines in 2-1. In 2-2, it is now hardened. So that is now just a self-weight and no longer has an external load applied. I go to 2-3, I have wet concrete again. 2-4, these are hardened plates and they are contributing to the strength. Um, and are just self-weight as far as the load goes. Same thing for 2.5 and my 2.6. That's the poor sequence. Then long-term, you've got a stage three, stage four. We're looking at the total uh, system uh, before load and then long-term with live load, which goes to your final um, post-construction stage analysis. And then we can display our loads here to clean this up a little bit. I think that's the basic there. I can get back into, like I said, more of the how to define the section properties and all of that. Um, but again, I'm going to assume that there's um, quite a few videos out there on how to do that. So I don't want to necessarily um, go back to those uh, if it's not as useful. So at this time, I'd like to take at least 10 minutes here to provide time for questions um, for people, if anyone has anything. Okay, thank you so much, Tom. That was really insightful. And actually, right now, I think we can start the Q&A discussion. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen because right now we have a few good questions. Okay, I'm going to... And Tom, I, I, this is Angela. I also see some questions that are very... Um, I guess like more specific in terms of 
um, asking for any tutorial. So, you know, after you answer each of the questions, I'll try to like add in if there's anything additional that I'll like to share too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, sure. So would you like me to just run through these? So yeah, Tom, we have five questions so far. Uh, I'm just gonna show you the question briefly. So if you need to show the matters, if you want to show like, you know, a quick demo to answer the questions, just let me know. So I can also share my screen uh, to you as the presenter. Sure. So, yeah, so first question here for continuous spans, do we need to ignore the deck intention except the rebar in the deck at negative moment? Yeah, typically you do because you're beyond the rupture um, stress of the concrete. Um, in MIDAS uh, for the composite system, it's actually calculating out a separate um, negative moment capacity versus positive moment capacity. So it's actually already taking that out, taking the deck out of that negative moment capacity calculation. And you can see that explicitly in the Excel output um, that it that it provides that I was had up there for a second. So um, you know, in that output, you'll see that explicitly that negative moment capacity is calculated without the deck. Um, can you demonstrate how the screed load is applied uh, with proper position eccentricity and the overhang bracket load? Yeah, I can jump back into that and show that real quick. I'll try to knock through a couple of these others and then do that. Um, will Midas perform co-checks as deck is plate, girder is frame, option lizard? Yes, it will. As long as the girder is the frame, um, it will provide those outputs. When using the design feature uh, for the steel girders, did you perform a sanity check in order to validate the results shown in minus? Absolutely, yes. Um, what we actually tend to do, particularly for these type, is we'll do a Grillage Plus analysis. We will do a 3D analysis if we think it's warranted, compare the two, and we will also do a girder line with V-load or other uh, modification analysis to sanity check it as well. So yes, absolutely. You should always perform a sanity check of anything that you're doing finite element. Um, is there a tutorial on construction stage loads? I believe there is um, a full tutorial on that one, but um, Angela or I don't know if Hope's on one of the two of you, would you like to comment on that one? Right, yeah, um, there are a few um, tutorials. I'll actually share this um, you know, in our follow-up emails. But to briefly show you these, one second. Okay, Angela, I'm gonna make you the presenter so you can share your screen, okay? Okay. Okay, so you see it, right? Yes. Okay, so you can actually find a tutorial when you go to your C drive and go to program files, go to Midas folder, go to Midas civil folder, go to manual and tutorials. And there you're gonna see a tutorial in number 23. It's called curved steel composite eye girder bridge design. And if you go to this tutorial, you can actually see a step-by-step -step instruction on you know, what to do with this. And also for the purpose of it, uh, you can actually go to Midas Civil Help Manual, which you can pull out by pressing F1 um, button on your keyboard. And also if you go to our um, website, uh, you can actually find an ebook on, uh, it's called User Guide uh, Steel Composite Girder Bridge Design, Ashto LRFD 16. Now we have 18 um, and we'll have 20 soon. Um, here you can also see, you know, like the purpose of this, like what does it mean to determine this and things like that. Basically, um, when we define just the load uh, case type, then, you know, those are used for static load cases. For construction stage analysis, um, Midas Civil automatically puts together the dead load. So actually it's a, yeah, it's a little bit of a double work. We already defined the load case in the, the basic load case, but you know, for construction stage analysis, we are kind of like distinguishing the wearing loads or, you know, like the, the super dead load, like separating them again. So yeah, it's a little bit of a double work, but you can find the references there. And just, one more question I wanted to get to before, oh, you know what, let's go over um, in the order. I'm going to make you a presenter again, Tito. Okay, thank you so much, Angela, for the explanations. And no. Tom, regarding 
Okay, Tom, regarding the second question, do you want to demonstrate how discrete loads are applied? Absolutely. So I can make you, okay, can I'm gonna make um, you the presenter, yeah. Sure. All right, you should have my screen now again. Um, so what you're seeing here is an Excel um, that is essentially the uh, information about the uh, deck placement loads. So here you can see we're using a 50 PSF um, walkway load, 10 PSF for form work, uh, bracket load, spacing, et cetera. Um, and then this is kind of a diagram of what that looks like, that you've got this exterior walkway, a screed rail here on the edge just outside of your overhang, and the bracket load being applied um, like this. And that's where I was saying that if you start to get above a certain distance that this load here is applied out of plane on the web and can lead to things like uh, crippling, or um, out of plane distortion, sometimes commonly called oil canning. Um, so, you know, that's where you might want to look at that. And most of the time, if you're below like a 70 inch web, that point's going to be right there at the bottom of the plane, you're not really going to have to worry about it. Um, but what we do is we calculate this, we get an overall um, load offset or, you know, what the total combined offset of that load, eccentricity of that load is. Um, and then in MIDAS, we can apply these loads as. Um, additional load cases, form work in this case, um, you know, additional utility loads if we have it, you know, all of that kind of thing. So um, with that, you can see these are loads being applied longitudinally. And a lot of our form work stuff, you know, we just break it into distributed load. It doesn't need to be anything too crazy um, with like individual loads applied. The screed loads are a little bit different those will get applied as point loads and you kind of just have to use engineering judgment as to where to place them or you could create multiple static load cases and just do different combinations to to achieve it whichever way you would like to do is perfectly fine um, so you can look at it that way um, in here you can see i've got my screed loads and those are applied with an eccentricity from the beam center line now um, if you go to the tables here you can see how that's actually set up so we've got our different additional loads. Um, these can be applied through the loads menu. Um, and then I will look at our load case here. Again, you can sort. So I could sort by load case first. So we've got perform work dead load, which is coming directly out of that spreadsheet. You can see that the distance in inches from the center line is being applied. And then the total uh, weight here, P1, P2, uh, which is the start of the distributed load and the distributed load. I'm in kips here, so it's going to look really small. But if I go to pounds, that'll flip that over. So you can see that's 8.75 pounds per <coughs> per inch um, is what's being applied. Or I can make that per foot here, and it'll it'll flip. This is a very nice, useful thing too. You can flip between pounds, feet, inches very fast down here. Um, so 105 pounds per foot is what our dead load is and you can see that, that again that is applied at a distance of 2.58 from the beam center line and we're applying that for the each of the individual you can do that with the screed loads the deck loads formic loads um, you just go to your load menu um, it's a static load case you can define the static load case here and its construction stage is the type and then when you want to go into adding any individual load it's just going to be a beam load that you apply, um, and I'm currently in post-processing, so if I kick it back to pre-processing, um, that will become available to me. Um, so load, static load, and you can see you can do it as a nodal load. Um, there's self-weight loads, liner element loads, and then you can define them right here with what is the weight, is there any eccentricity, click on the eccentricity, and you can provide it in there. So it's just an eccentric load on the pipeline. So the other question that someone had asked on the um, negative moment. So again, if you go to the design condition negative flexor, it's gonna have different section properties um, for the negative section calculation than the positive. So you just look here in the Excel and you can see that explicitly. Is there any other questions to go that you wanna yes. answer? Yes, we have more questions, Tom. I'm gonna share my screen again. Mm. So the next question is, uh, okay, I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, wait. 
This is for Angela from Ida's team. Is Midas planning to develop wine load auto generations? And the rest of the questions, I think it's for you, Tom. So the seven the seventh question is how can I define floor beam in Midas Wizard? The next one is is there a check that is made for exterior girders, rotations, and stresses and flanges? So, okay, I'll uh, answer oops, sorry. sorry. <laughs> I'll yeah. answer questions especially for six and also yep. Eight and also, yeah, uh, that are mainly related to our future development. So we actually do not have uh, auto wind generation, as you know, Libin, you probably know. Um, Tito, can you make me a presenter? Yes, of course. So actually, yeah, that's a request that we've been receiving for uh, quite many times. And you know, when, usually whenever we receive a request, we develop them. Um, same as this one, you know, uh, that was just implemented early this year. This is to apply, you know, unbalanced um, vertical load uh, for your life uh, for on, for you know uh, on your truck wheels on a curved bridges. So this was actually implemented upon uh, another Michael Baker engineer's request too. Uh, wind load is something that we received the request many, many times, but we are actually taking a slightly different approach for the wind load um, development. For, so basically, um, we are currently working on uh, uh, developing a new standard version of Midas Civil. It's just a term we are calling it. Uh, we are basically working on a major upgrade on Midas Civil. And the, usually the type of upgrade that we've been working on is like, you know, as, as I show over here, adding, you know, like um, features here and there or upgrading the code, um, you know, ASH to LRFD, LRFR, or SHBDC CSA um, to 19 and things like that. But this time, this upgrade is a little more major uh, bottom point. We are actually upgrading our um, software solver to that of a structural analysis program to a mechanical analysis program. Um, we, we also have a, a, a mechanical program which is used by Samsung or like Hyundai. Um, and we are actually replacing civil solver with the mechanical programs. So that way the analysis is much faster and also we can uh, implement additional uh, more advanced features and analysis and the speed of analysis will be like more than um, it's going you're gonna it's gonna reduce to less than 50 percent and in the pre post processing and also design we are implementing API uh, meaning for for the wind load development or any you know modifications that you need to make in the design checking you'll be able to integrate you know uh, custom user made wizards into the program. So if you, yeah, so for the wind load or for, um, you know, also implementing the design checking for plate made um, bridges, bridges that are made of shell elements, um, I think this API is going to allow us to, you know, develop those features much quicker and faster. But wind load um, uh, auto generation and also um, design checking of plate elements, we're actually waiting until um this uh this major update is completed which is targeted to be completed by the end of this year and then we're going to be able to um find our ways to implement those features more efficiently um because yeah so i want to give you a quick overview of um where our development about my civils at so yeah um there's a little bit of this disappointment, I guess, like it's not going to be implemented immediately. However, the bright side is, you know, after um, this year, we're going to be able to implement a lot more features um, and various options, custom user developed features. Uh, you're, you'll be able to plug them into Midas Civil a lot more um, in a, a lot more flexible manner. But yep, I hope I answered your question. Okay. So Angela, do you also want to answer the eight, uh, the ad questions about the? Wait, I'm gonna share my screen. Yeah. So the the ad questions. Do you want to also answer this question, Angela?
Okay, I think we can move on to Tom. Yes, Tom, okay. we have more, yeah, five oh, more questions. Thank you. Yeah, yeah five no more questions. Uh, I can yeah. try to run through those and I may throw a couple of them back to, to Angela because I know she's probably got yeah. the answer to a few of them. Yeah, okay. Uh, um, how can I define a floor beam in Midas uh, Wizard? So the um, diaphragms or cross frames are an input within the um, composite girder wizard and you could basically just make it a single element that's a single horizontal element and then it's going to come in with the rigid link you could adjust it as needed um, essentially you could do it to any any point that you want by simply making two nodes um, that are basically centered at the mid depth of the beam or wherever your floor beam happens to be connect a beam element to that and then provide a rigid link to the um, to the main beam nodes um, or you know, like I said in wizard you just basically do it as if you didn't have any X members you just only had the bottom of the cross frame um, and then you put in your your section for the floor beam for that that should work now the only thing there with the floor beam is if the deck is making contact with the floor beam you may also have to provide a rigid link to the plate elements um, you know above it to make sure that the live load is distributing directly to the floor beam versus going to the main beams and then to the floor beam so there might be a little bit of extra work you got to do there with some of your connections of your elements to make that to make that function um, is there a check uh, that made on the exterior girder rotations and stresses so there is the primary stress plus one third longitudinal or sorry lateral stress um, that is checked within the, the system. Um, you also tend to, if you're really interested in girder rotation and stress, you really need to go to the all plate model and, and run a full 3D to look at those uh, girder rotations specifically. Um, you'll get something out of the standard checks using the um, deck as plate, beam as frame, but again, the, the main reason to go to that full 3D is exactly what you're talking about, looking at those rotations and stresses. Um, for the first question, you mean to ignore the deck and the analysis, not design. I think I see what you're saying, that you're talking about the stiffness more so than the actual capacity. Um, yeah, you can adjust that. If you go into the section um, set up under the properties menu, you can adjust the stiffness of any, any segments that you want. Um, we can follow up offline on that if, if you really want to get into it. Most of the time, it's not going to make that much difference, I don't think. Um, will the deck as frame type model calculate loads and stresses in deck elements? Um, yes, it's going to be treated um, relatively simply. Um, but yeah, you, you can get the stresses at the top of the section. Um, and then the steel girder section varying linearly at mid-span. I believe that there is a new um, item in your applying of properties that will allow you to apply a start and end section and allow it to, to move linearly um, and have a varying section. Um, and I'll, I'll, that's one that I would defer to Angela um, on. I think she can show that. But the other way to do that is just the traditional way, which is you either use the average or, or, or minimum and you know, have a break it up into lengths and you have, you know, uh, you know first couple elements or this section, then it kind of switches up to a bigger section over time. Yeah, over the length. If you have any trouble uh, defining linearly varying girder section in the wizard, worst case, uh, you can always come out of the wizard and, you know, um, uh, you can define a section property type uh, tapered, taper type section properties. And tapered literally means like, you know, it, the taper section property has start section property and end section property. And you can also set up the variation type, linear, parabolic, you know, um, you know, which um, the degree of the, um, the equation. And yeah, so it's not actually very intuitive. It's, it's difficult to handle the, in the wizard. But once you're out of the wizard, you can always um, change the section property information. Yeah, I will say a lot of times the wizard is there to really get you your, your skeleton, your framework, right. how things are set up. And then you can adjust. So that's like with the flared um, setup or if you have some multi skews. Sometimes what you have to do is you run the wizard and then you just go back in and adjust nodal locations, adjust properties as needed. Um, and it gets it so that all your connections are there. A lot of the work is done in building the frame of the model, but that you do sometimes have to go back in and do some of these adjustments when you have unusual situations. 
Is there a number 12 to 12, 13? So that's one for Angela. And then the last yeah. one. Um, oh, for number 12, I think uh, since this doesn't focus so much on our topic today, I think it's better I'll reach out to Victor separately or we have another session in the future um, regarding CIM and civil together. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank I you, Angela. 13 uh, is similar to one or two of the other questions, I think, regarding the, um, you know, the stiffness that it's calculating for the negative region where it would be in tension. Um, and you can manually apply those if you would like to. Um, and it is, you're, you're correct, that it's slightly more accurate here if we ignore the deck intention um, for a stiffness or analysis perspective. Um, again, you can go into your section manager under the properties and there's a stiffness scale factor that you can apply that will allow you to manually adjust that if you like. I do not believe it does that by default, but maybe Angela can confirm on that one or check into it. Right, I mean, if you really need to disregard uh, um, the deck uh, for the analysis too, then I'll say the best way is to kind of like tweak uh, the section property and make it minimal. Um, in the States, um, a lot of our engineers are um, actually fine, you know, considering the deck stiffness um, in the analysis phase and just disregard it in the design for the capacity. Um, but if your need is different, then I'll say you kind of have to work around it by maybe defining the section, um, modifying the section or material property um, for some of the calculations. Um, you can either, um, you know, maybe uh, tweak, uh, kind of like, you know, make your section property a little like very minimal on those negative moment regions. Or, you know, if you want to do that using material property, then there is a feature called uh, assign, you know, uh, there is a feature in the analysis uh, main menu to define different boundary condition per an analysis type and analysis cases. And maybe you want to use that to link um, different material and boundary conditions um, for different type of analysis you're using. So you, you want to make sure the deck is kind of like uh, neglected in the analysis too. Okay. Okay, yeah, uh, Stanley, this is actually something that's gonna come um, with the major upgrade too. With the upgrade of our analysis solver to that of mechanical, we're gonna be able to do a lot more like fluid dynamics analysis in MIDAS, um, Civil, Gen, and also FE and X um, too. Okay, thank and you in so the, much. And in the follow-up email, we'll try to include a, um, a PDF document that briefly explains about our analysis product um, roadmap um, uh, regarding this major upgrade we are working on. Okay, thank you so much, Angela and Tom, for the great answers. And for all the attendees, if you guys have more questions, you can reach out to us at grow at microsoft.com. You can email us and we will get back to you with the answers. And yeah, I think that's all uh, for the questions and the answers. So Tom, before we end the sessions, is there, is there anything you want to add or to say to the audience? Uh, no, I don't think at this time. Thank you everyone for joining. Um, if you do have additional questions um, or you, you need more information, please reach out to, to Midas um, and then, you know, they can also pass it on to me if there's something that they, they feel they'd like my input on. But, um, you know, I think hopefully they'll be able to answer as well. Okay. Thank you, Tom. And thank yeah, you, Tom. thank you so much, Tom, for joining us today. Thank you for the great presentations and that was really insightful. And for all the attendees, I want to remind you again, if you want the recording of this session, just simply go to www.mydesoft.com slash network. I'm sending the link on the question uh, bars and I'm, I will also show you the brief uh, of the website so you can go to www.mydesoft.com slash Midas Expert Network and you can go to the events or resources so you can basically access all the recordings all the articles based on the sessions that we have today and in the past so yeah go to www.mydesoft.com slash Midas Expert Network so yeah, I think that's it. Thank you so much uh, everyone for attending the sessions. Hopefully you guys can learn 
a lot of things today and thank you for Tom, thank you for Angela and yeah, see you in the upcoming sessions and have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Tito. Thank you, thank you everybody. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. You too. Bye. Bye. Thank you.